Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever you are. Uh, my name is Abdel Rahman Nimeri. I'm the EFSO Secretary Treasurer, and it is my great uh, pleasure and privilege uh, to join you today uh, at the World Obesity Day uh, for a round table to discuss um, uh, about obesity. Uh, with me today are uh, very important figures in the field of obesity. Uh, and I'll start from uh, my screen from the top left. Uh, Professor Lillian Cow, she is the uh, uh, president of IFSO. Uh, uh, welcome, Lillian. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, great, a pleasure to have you. Uh, Professor Guillermo Macedo, um, uh, he is the uh, 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 president of the uh, World uh, uh, Gastroenterology Association organization. Welcome, Guillermo. Thank you. Welcome to everyone. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Same here. Uh, Professor Scott Cora, the president-elect of uh, If So. Uh, welcome, Scott. Thank you very much. It's an absolute honor and privilege to be part of this program. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shanu Kuthari, the president of uh, ASMBS. Welcome, Shanu. Thank you, Abdel. Privileged to be here. And uh, last but not least, Professor John Wilding, the uh, 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 president, current president of the World Obesity Federation. Uh, welcome, John. Good morning, and thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, great. So I, I'd like to start by thanking uh, uh, everyone on the call today for their leadership uh, in getting together round table because I think this is a tremendous start to have uh, such important organizations represented by you uh, coming together uh, to call to action that everybody has has to act uh, and needs to act so uh, the themes of this round will be to try to talk about obesity as a disease and, and, and try to emphasize that uh, speak a little bit about obesity bias and stigma and get your thoughts about that um, draw some similarities between obesity and cancer and try to learn from the lessons uh, learned in cancer care. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about access to obesity care like thereof, and then we'll conclude by talking about the MDT team. So, you know, we, we all know that obesity is a disease it, and it resembles cancer in, in many things. Um, both of them have uh, stages of severity, uh, both of them uh, literature shows that early refer referral leads to better care. Both of them needs an MDT team. Both can recur and come back. And both lead to a significant healthcare cost and affect patients and patients' lives. So I'd like to start by asking you uh, in one minute to make a comment and, and, and maybe try to give me your thoughts about the same issue. Do we feel we are where we need to be in treating obesity like cancer is treated worldwide? And if not, what do you think are the barriers uh, uh, to getting that and, and quick suggestions? A minute to a minute and a half for each. We'll start with Lillian. Thank you for a very good question. Well, I believe obesity is recognized as one of the most important public health problems facing the world today. Now, recent estimates indicate that there are over 650 million adults who are obese globally. So obesity is a complex disease, a medical problem that increases the risk of other diseases and health problems such as heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and cancers. I think the greatest hurdle people with obesity face is stigma and discrimination. Many stakeholders still believe the etiology of obesity is related to behavior. Example, lack of exercise, overeating, food addiction, and believe genetics and the environment play a secondary role, and hence the treatment of obesity is the responsibility of the patient. So what I believe what has to change is for all stakeholders to accept that obesity is a disease. It is a disease no different from diabetes or cancer, 
and hence the treatment of obesity should be considered and be collectively addressed by all stakeholders. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Cao. Uh, Professor Macedo. Well, thank you. Um, it, it, it's a wonderful question, and that poses the um, the whole issue that we are going to to discuss throughout this next hour. And uh, I believe that uh, Professor Lillian Cao expressed almost um, everything that we could, and, and summed up everything that we could say concerning this topic. This is a very complex condition. And I think at this time, the big challenge for us as a medical community is how to deal with the stigma. Uh, because we all have our different skills, our different approaches, uh, our different ways of, of trying to, to tackle this specific condition in one individual. But the fact is that we need to improve much more in terms of how do we approach these patients. Um, there are several strategies that eventually we can talk about that, but I, I think the most important issue at this time is changing the mindset of all of us, uh, trying not to, let's say, talk about the obese patients, for example, but about the patients with obesity, which is a slightly different concept, but very important because you take off the stigma and you put the whole issue on the condition. We have to treat these patients as patients that have a very complex and biological condition, and that will for sure need, um, in different moments, uh, many of us. And so I think that is the main issue. Right, so, so changing the language to combat uh, the, the stigma. Right. Great, great thought. Uh, uh, Professor Shakar. Well, you encapsulated the situation quite well with the comparison to cancer and all of the points that you made. And it made me think back to the first gastric bypass I did, which was approximately 1991, 1992. At the time, nobody would have called obesity a disease. It would have just been an eating disorder, you know, people who just can't control their eating. And obviously, for those reasons, it had very little support in the lake community, insurance industry, et cetera. We've advanced it to the point now that you can make very good comparisons as you did to cancer. However, there is still one difference. We don't subject cancer patients to the hurdles that they have to jump over to get care like we do with obesity still. And that the insurance companies can arbitrarily determine who gets care and who doesn't. And at the end of the day, less than 1% of all patients get who are eligible for bariatric surgery get bariatric surgery that would be entirely unheard of in the cancer community if you said one out of 10 women one out of 100 women get the care they need so we've got a ways to go but we're in the right direction and i agree with you that it's an excellent comparison to cancer other than the fact that cancer has more loyal following in in the late community patients insurance industry than uh, the obesity does at this time so, so great point. So, so, so working on on access to obesity care, similar to how access is paved for for cancer patients. Ex excellent points, uh, Professor uh, uh, Kutari. Yes, thank you. Um, um, yes, not only do I think we should. Is there a good analogy to cancer? But I think we should we should adopt it. What also uh, the link to cancer is what people don't know is we we've, we've made good strides on teaching about the link between diabetes uh, and and the impact that metabolic barrier surgery has, but a lot of people don't know that there are 13 cancers that the number one risk factor for those is obesity. And so that's actually the theme, cancer prevention for our annual ASM MBS meeting coming up this June in Dallas, Texas. Um, trying to get that message out because when you look at patients who, live, who have metabolic barrier surgery compared to those who don't, they live longer. Why? Less cardiac events and actually less cancers. And I do think we need to begin moving in this direction where we now, as we begin to add anti-obesity medications into our armamentarium uh, in the U.S., at least, I think we need to start thinking about this uh, process in terms of adjuvant therapy and neoadjuvant therapy, uh, much like we do with cancer. Sometimes it's chemo followed by surgery followed by chemo or radiation and chemo followed by surgery. 
um, or the current the cancer recurrence, and now we had more chemo. Um, we never blame the patient in those situations when when a cancer recurs. We call it recurrence. Uh, we don't say it's a failure, and we need to start moving in a similar language for uh, in our specialty as well. So great point, uh, Dr. Thari. So so drawing a line that connects uh, obesity to cancer, and I congratulate ASMBS for having the annual meeting, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the theme being uh, cancer and, and, and knowing that 13 cancers stem from obesity. So, so uh, excellent point. Um, uh, and then Professor uh, Wilding, I, I, I promise you, you're not going to be the last at every question. Next time we'll start. <laughs> Professor Wilding. Thank, th thank, thank you very much. I mean, I think a lot of the really important points uh, have already been made. I, I do think that the issue about stigma is so important because that stigma is not just in the population it's also within our profession and other healthcare professionals and so part of the work you know part of this what we're doing today is about helping support those people understand a little bit more about obesity understand the fact that it, it is about genetics it's about the environment that people are brought up in uh, that, that that pushes them towards obesity not because they've made some incorrect personal choice at some point in their lives uh, and, and the point that I always make uh, you know when I'm trying to talk about this issue with with patients and, and, and with colleagues is the fact that you would never blame someone with type 1 diabetes for their disease we know it's an autoimmune disease which has genetic and environmental components just like obesity and we offer them treatments but we do know that if we offer them the best treatments the the modern technology uh, even th those individuals if they work hard they will probably end up with better outcomes than those people who maybe are less interested in their condition but we we have to have those treatments available whether they be medical treatments surgical treatments and of course support to make some of the changes that are really hard to make to lifestyle in our in our modern society which is again not the person's fault it's the fault of the environment that we're all living in today great great points so uh, let me let me go next to uh, professor uh, macedo and i'm going to ask you about uh, um, you know the pool of patients who do not uh, have access to surgical care so the largest pool of patients affected by the obesity uh, uh, disease are patients with DMI between 30 and 40, and they don't have any uh, associated uh, obesity-related medical problems. And they don't have many durable solutions. Yeah, there's some, some medications now. So if endoscopic therapy is the answer, why are most of the options not FDA approved and not covered by insurance today? I mean, at least in the U.S., I, I, you can educate us about the situation in New York. Well, um, the fact is that endoscopic therapy is 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 one type of answer. It's it's not the ultimate answer, um, but it's one type of answer. And the fact is that at, at this time in, in the U.S., there are five endoscopic options that are that have FDA approval. So the scenario is not. That is not so so insipid. Um, so we have still we still have some weapons to use in terms of endoscopy. But the, the current scenario is also very interesting because actually I, I think uh, it, it is promising in terms of endoscopy. And by the way, I, I think it's appropriate to quote here someone that the Americans love very much, Vince Lombardi, which, which is not a scientist, was a great leader and a, a great trainer uh american football which is funny because i'm a, I'm a soccer boy not, not american football anyway i'm from europe but then, anyway um vince lombardi used to say something very appropriate at this time um we didn't lose the game we, we just ran out of time so i think this is exactly what's happening in the endoscopy world we, we it, the story is not told yet um I, I think we are improving in terms of what we can achieve in terms of endoscopy and um, we are getting nowadays new and growing evidence about the support and the, the need for endoscopic therapy in many of these patients 
And there's a very recent paper in clinical gastroenterology and hepatology, a, a meta-analysis, a review um, about the, um, the, uh, the efficacy of uh, endoscopic procedures in, in these patients, considering the focus on the liver. So showing that there was a clear um, um, benefit over histology and non-histological features in NAFLD. And as we all know, NAFLD is a shadow for many of these patients with obesity. So we have growing evidence that endoscopy will play a role. So remind Vince Lombardi. Great, 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 great comment. So, so, so stay tuned. The endoscopy is, is coming on the turn. Okay, excellent. Fantastic. Um, so, Professor Wildling, uh, you know, despite the high prevalence of, of obesity, the, the number of healthcare providers and who have special training and expertise in treating this, this disease, in comparison to, to the number of patients, and it, is, is, it really pales in comparison. So, if we draw analogy from cancer, I mean, there, there are many subspecialties. But we, we are not there yet. So what are the strategies that we can do to bridge this gap? Thank you. I think this is a really important question. Firstly, I think we need to start in very early training. We need to start in the medical schools, but also across in, in training of nurses and other allied healthcare professionals like dietitians and physiotherapists, so that uh, obesity is, is actually built into to their curriculum just as much as cancer or diabetes or heart disease is, uh, because that way it will become an established part of, of training right from the word go. So, you know, in the UK, we are adopting our, uh, adapting our curricula to include obesity. In my university in Liverpool, we have sections on, uh, sessions on obesity right from year one of medical school. Uh, but I know that is not the case in, in, in all medical schools across the world. So that's you know one place to start, is really at the early part of training. Uh, of course, as we develop through uh, our, our training and as we become more specialized, we need to be able to train uh, specialists. So we need uh, specialist training. We also need to improve the generalist training. So physicians and surgeons in other specialties are aware of the treatment options that are available for obesity so that they can make appropriate referrals when they're seeing patients often for obesity related diseases and they will you know go down and treat the diabetes patient with insulin without thinking about the underlying cause and, and that's something that we see all the time of course there is a limit to what education and training that big organizations even like WAF and if so can do but WAF for example has the scope program uh, which is enlarging and and and, and uh, educating many people around the world about obesity but I think we're going to have to cascade that training and train the trainers which is what we're trying to do now so that the more voices we have uh, the stronger they become and, and and then as the knowledge base builds we'll end up with a very strong uh, voice and an understanding of obesity across the medical and allied health professionals. Great. So, so building a foundation and, and cascading. And I've done the SCO program myself. It's a tremendous program. And I congratulate uh, uh, and commend uh, the World Obesity Federation for putting it together. So uh, next we'll go to uh, uh, Dr. Shano Kuthari, very close to where I'm at right now. Um, so Dr. Kuthari, as you know, the value in having higher quality uh, and, and lower cost, whatever uh, a treatment you give. And the experience of metabolic and breast surgery in the US is a shiny example of that, on how to improve quality, design a quality improvement program. Can you describe to us the journey of quality with bariatrics in the US and tell us how it's been done, and, and especially in the areas of cost reduction, improving quality, risk adjustment. Yes, thank you. Very important point, especially as our um, health care model and reimbursement uh, changes and shifts from fee-for-service to fee-for-value um, in the U.S. model. And um, honestly, there was um, a time in our society where 
um, this came out of necessity. Um, and unfortunately, we were there was a point where uh, many years ago where the quality was not good in in Beartic surgery, and we were having um, some centers were having higher than expected complication rates. And of course, with that uh, comes a significant uh, healthcare expenditures to the point where in the U.S. health uh, plans were on the verge of non-coverage across the board for bariatric surgery services. And that, that forced us to look at this issue. Um, and out of that eventually um, came the uh, Surgical Review Corporation and ultimately, uh, which oversaw quality and our databases. And then ultimately we ended up mer uh, working with the American College of Surgeons and developing the Metabolic and Bariatric Quality Initiative, which we have to this day, MBSA Quip. And um, we have accredited centers and qualifications for accredited surgeons. And I'm pleased to say that it's 100% data entry for those uh, accredited centers. And we will hit a milestone this year where our millionth patient encounter will be placed into this. And so we now have over 130 publications out of this database in the, in the literature now that's helping us to drive uh, this kind of level of quality. And there's very few disciplines where in three decades we can see uh, mo what I call moving the decimal. I mean, our mortality rate in 1975, as I have Dr. Mason's original brochure uh, for weight loss surgery from the University of Iowa, um, showed a mortality rate of 3% for elective vertic surgery. You know, we've since moved that to 0.3%, and now I call it refining the decimal. Now we're down into the, you know, 0.1% uh, a range and you know it's as safe as the appendectomy or cholecystectomy now in the US which is it's and uh, which is quite an achievement that's that's really fantastic so 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 getting bariatric surgery to be as safe as gallbladder surgery through having a registry with 100% capture uh, through having centers of excellence and congratulations a million patients that's that's really amazing um, so next we'll go to, uh, to Dr. Uh, 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 Cora. So Dr. Cora, as you know, most obese adolescents grow up to become obese adults and obesity in children is increasing and it's a significant problem. Can you tell us about, this, about a success story about managing childhood obesity and uh, what, how can we tackle this problem? Uh, having not taken care of many pediatric uh, children with obesity, I can't really speak from expertise. However, from my experience with adults, I think a lot of it is applicable. It's uh, start with the education, as uh, we had discussed previously by Dr. Uh, Professor Wilding had mentioned. One thing that came to note in my mind is that our primary care physicians didn't have BMI charts in their exam rooms. And we surveyed them and they were more comfortable asking about sexual issues than they did about weight issues with their patients, which I thought was phenomenal. But we got to start that with the, with the adolescent population because you're right, the next generation of children are going to be the heaviest ever and probably with the shortest life expectancy in the past several decades because of so much rampant obesity and related disorders. We got to get to these folks at a younger age. It probably involves getting families involved, uh, professionals such as behavioral therapists, dietitians to help educate proper eating habits. Uh, everybody's going to have to buy into it and everybody's going to have to be responsible for part of the puzzle to put it all together. And it's going to be challenging, but uh, that next generation is going to bankrupt the world with healthcare expenditures. Amazing. So, so, so a generation that could die before its parents. Uh, uh, sobering thought. Um, thank you, Dr. Chikora. So, Dr. Cow, uh, the uh, you know worldwide metabolic and bariatric surgery is quite variable. The type of surgery is performed, the involvement of the MDT, and the long-term follow-up of outcomes. How do you suggest that we make changes and and try to address these barriers? That's a very good question, Dr. Roman. Most patients having undergone metabolic or bariatric surgery can expect substantial weight loss. But to achieve this, 
patients are expected to commit to healthy eating and regular exercise. So the patient who follows the post-operative diet and exercise instructions can generally expect good results. The patient who does not make the lifestyle changes will not lose the desired amount of weight despite successful surgery. So having metabolic and bariatric surgery is just one step in a lifelong process of weight management. So the importance of involving an MDT on psychological, nutritional and exercise guidance and long-term follow-up must be part of the educational process and the weight loss surgery for all patients undergoing metabolic and bariatric surgery. One of the barriers, of course, is the cost of providing the MDT service. Involving stakeholders such as government agencies and insurance companies would definitely help. Now, secondly, access to these allied health providers is not always easy, but I would encourage that metabolic and surgical clinics have these team incorporated in their service so that they can provide such a wider service to their patients to ensure participation of their patients along this journey. Great, so, so <clears throat> looking at costs and incorporating uh, providers within MDT team, uh, great, great thoughts. So uh, Professor Wilding, let me come back to you and, 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 and talk about uh, uh, metabolic surgery or, or diabetes, surgery for diabetes. So uh, a group uh, came together to put together the diabetes surgery guidelines uh, in, in initially 2005 and then finally in 2016. And this was endorsed by more than 50 organizations as, as the most effective treatment for someone who has a severe obesity, a BMI over 40, and, and type 2 diabetes. Yet, worldwide, that has not led these guidelines, despite endorsement, has not changed much of the referral patterns of, of patients with type 2 diabetes and severe obesity. And, and, and historically, we've had diseases that has really shifted from the way it was treated. I'll give you examples like the way we used to treat anal cancer with surgery. What are your thoughts on why the diabetes surgery guidelines have not made such an impact? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really unfortunate. I mean, and certainly, you know, our experience in the UK has been very similar in that we have That's seen... you might be muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, our experience in the UK has been very similar. We've seen yeah. those international guidelines change. We've even had our National Institute for Care and NICE, Care Excellence, NICE, make guidelines uh, suggesting that uh, for people with type 2 diabetes in a body mass index uh, above 30 with the recent onset of diabetes can be considered for bariatric surgery. And yet we have seen virtually no surgery in that group of individuals between BMI of 30 and 35 uh, with recent onset diabetes in the UK since those guidelines were published uh, more than five years ago now. Uh, I think part of that has been because of the, the very tight controls over the number of people that can have surgery in general. And so it tends to be people with more severe obesity uh, with complications that are being offered surgery in, in, in the UK, but that does include some people with diabetes, but the numbers really haven't shifted. I think it's about, again, it's about education and again, providing people with, with the evidence. We only need to look at all of the published evidence now, both from randomized controlled trials with now follow-ups of more than five years showing better outcomes for those people who are treated with surgery. Uh, we have very strong uh, data from observational studies, some of them very large, showing, again, better outcomes in terms of mortality, diabetes complications. Uh, and yet, if that was 
a, a new operation for cancer, people would say, well, we've got to we've got to change what we're doing. You know, what we're doing isn't working. We've got to change it. And yet we're not seeing that happening. I think it, it is it is about uh, just making sure the evidence is out there and trying to, again, educate our colleagues uh, that these options are available. I think there is a little bit of reluctance uh, to do that, e even amongst specialists in, in, in diabetes. And I think that's going to be something that we have to address at some point in the future. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so uh, next I'm going to go to uh, Dr. Um, Macedo and back to the cancer analogy. Um, you know, cancer teams are aligned based on disease rather than specialty. Um, what are the impediments on aligning patients around the disease rather than the specialty uh, for our care? Well, um, you're right, but, but in, in fact, I, I wouldn't say that there are impediments. Um, again, we need time, and the time we need is to, to build up a new narrative um, throughout the medical and surgical community to make clear that we all have complementary roles and, and delivered by different uh, insights and perspectives. Um, many times we find ourselves as multitask doctors. Uh, we try to achieve the ultimate solution uh, on our own, but the fact is that I feel that we need to develop something else in our sphere. Um, a concept that we are simply another piece on the obesity management puzzle. And that set the whole difference. Um, if, if we construct an integrated pathway um, where we feel we can play a, a role along with other professionals, very soon we, we will understand how obesity needs a simultaneous multimodal approach rather than an add-on battlefield of experts. So I, I think if we manage to do that, I think we give the sign, the perfect sign, so that the, all the other stakeholders could understand perfectly how can we um, manage obesity. Great, great comment. Um, uh, I was having some technical difficulty. Dr. Chikora, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Right. So, uh, uh, so if you if you look at at what Andy Warhol has said, perception precedes reality, and it doesn't matter what the reality is. What matters is patients' perception, and patients perceive metabolic and bariatric surgery as an invasive and drastic option. Despite the clear safety, despite the literature, despite the fact that it really helps, how do we work and change? I think we have to have a consistent message that we're stating all the time until ultimately it seeps through the environment and it seeps through society and people start to come away saying, you know, these operations are near miraculous and they do work and they're not um, extremely dangerous. and if you weigh it against my diabetes, I think I'd rather have surgery. One of the things that patients uh, hate the most is having to shoot insulin. So that's an angle to take about, you know, we might be able to get you off of the needles and the insulin and all that. If I could just back up just a little bit for a moment, uh, there was a discussion at ASMBS one year with Henry Buckwald in attendance about uh, how do we get the message out? It's the question you just asked me to more and more people in the environment and in the community, particularly the healthcare payers. And Henry said, you don't have to do that. They know the data more than you do. That's their job. The issue here is that the health insurance industry is like a car manufacturer. The difference is Ford, General Motors, Toyota makes money by selling cars. The health industry makes money by not paying out for healthcare. And that's what we have to tackle. We have to get in there and say, this isn't a money issue. We're not looking for return on investment. We're looking on return on life and quality of life. And that we need to be able to provide these services and you need to figure out how to pay for it because in the long run, it benefits the patient. 
great comment. So consistent messaging and 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 elevating the value of a of a live. Um, Dr. Cow, if you look at the resolution of of type two diabetes after metabolic and bath surgery, it's been shown that it's related to early referral. If it does make sense that we don't wait until cancer spreads and we refer early. When it comes to, to metabolic and bacterial surgery, what are the strategies that you recommend we can do to achieve this early referral of, of patients with diabetes? So I think obesity and type 2 diabetes are diseases that can substantially decrease life expectancy, diminish the quality of life, and increase healthcare costs. So as the incidence of obesity and diabetes continue to rise by epidemic proportions, we know that the term diabetes has been coined to describe obesity-dependent diabetes. We also know that moderate and sustained weight loss, 5 to 10% of body weight can improve insulin action, decrease fasting glucose concentrations, and reduce the need of some diabetes medications. So. We also know that metabolic and bariatric surgery is rec recommended when diet, exercise, medical treatments have failed, or when patients develop obesity-related problems, such as diabetes and blood pressure problems. So it's important to get the message out that these associated medical conditions are life-threatening and shortens one's lifespan by 10 years or more. And by losing excess weight and subsequent improvement or resolution of the obesity associated medical conditions, especially type 2 diabetes, the induced shortened lifespan can be regained with early referral. So a stronger message couldn't be got through if you tell someone that they can regain their shortened lifespan with early referral of their patient with obesity. Great, great comments. Um, um, so, Professor Kathari, in 1991, the National Institute of Health put a consensus conference that put surgical therapy for um, obesity on the map, and it helped define, um, you know, the indications of doing metabolic and bariatric surgery. But these guidelines were done more than three decades ago, and it is now somewhat obsolete. Um, you know, we've talked about the diabetes surgery guidelines. What can we do with the plethora of evidence that shows that BMI is not the best strategy to stratify patients, yet this is the way insurance carriers and clinicians are using to treat patients today? Yeah, well, that's a, we could have a whole day long uh, course just on answering that important question. But um, I think, it starts with it starts with us, and to dovetail a little bit of what Dr. Shakora said is, um, I think we need to we need um, to change it. I mean, nobody else quotes a 30 year old guideline as their you know governing indications for anything. I mean, can you imagine if uh, Cardiology Society quote referenced a 30 year old document for their indications for intervention or uh, stroke guidelines are 30 years old or um, even cancer guidelines that are 30 years old. We've made a lot of um, therapeutic interventions, including in our field in the last 30 years. And the, the NIH no longer does consensus conference statements. They're out of that business. So we're sort of trapped in the past. So I think the first step is we update those. Um, and we're in the process of doing that with ASMBS and in conjunction with IFSO. And I think the next step is once we can, uh, we're, we're working on that right now uh, and hopefully have that work product out within uh, this year. And then if both boards were to approve those, I think we have uh, the editor-in-chief of obesity surgery with us and we have a verbal agreement from the editor-in-chief of SWORD as well, Raul Rosenthal, that you know, we stop putting that in our method section. We quit referencing the NIH 1991 conference uh, as the, the, in our methodology, and we we reference the whatever it'll be called, the 2022 ASMBS if so updated guidelines for indications for metabolic and bariatric surgery, something to that effect, and start when we're up against payers and they call us and 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 in that document we'll have 
the BMI 30 to 35 for the diabetes, the lower BMI for uh, uh, Asian population, and an extended list of comorbid conditions beyond the traditional ones that we are so used to re referencing. And I think when we go up against the payers and then there is a um, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer review and they say, you know, this patient doesn't meet our criteria, we can turn around and say, why are you quoting a 30-year-old document? We have the updated guidelines. I mean, this is what societies do. They reference their own guidelines um, but, and hold themselves accountable to that. So I think that would be a big first step. Uh, BMI is a challenge. It's hard for it to go away. I think we have to get to a point of talking about metabolic burden, but I just don't know for it's so easy in use. I think we just have to work. First step is expanding the indications around the BMI. Great. So, so uh, I'm delighted to hear that there's an actionable item of this new guidelines coming in combination of uh, uh, if so, on ASMBS, that is a that is a tremendous uh, great step. So, so great congratulations to both organizations. So, um, next question to Dr. To Professor Wilding, and, and and really back to the cancer analogy. You know, 40 years ago, you know, a large breast cancer, a large rectal cancer would get radical surgical treatment. Um, and a young patient with breast cancer would just be treated by surgery would be a mystery but today we know a lot of the genetic uh, um, causes and, and some patients get prophylactic surgery if they have BRCA1 or, or, or two mutations some patients get surgery at a very early age is it time to include a, a, a geneticist within our MDT team and and look at certain patients patients with recurrence of disease patients with high, very high BMI and look at the genetics component and treat patients before the disease is already at, at, at later stages? Yeah, I think the genetics is, is, is really interesting. It's, it's really important. We know that if we just use BMI with all its limitations that we've just discussed, that 60 to 70 percent of our BMI, if you like, is, is inherited and that there are some individuals who have rare single gene disorders that is a major contributor to their their obesity the difficulty we have is is finding that needle in the haystack if you like who are those individuals who have the rare identifiable disorders some of which now are treatable with very specific and very effective medications like setmelanotide uh, for patients with pomc or leptin receptor mutations which is an approved treatment uh, so it's really important that we identify those individuals and the only way we're going to do that is by doing appropriate genetic screening. We actually held a, a, a meeting uh, under the stock conference uh, umbrella uh, recently with, within World Obesity and we are in the process of putting together a consensus statement that will talk about who should be screened for obesity uh, using genetic uh, screening tools. Uh, uh, and that will span the whole lifespan. So from children where obviously if, you're, if you develop severe obesity before the age of two years, the chances of genetic cause is very high, but also considering those adults with severe obesity. But there's also a lot of research that needs to be done in this area. For example, the genes that we know predict a high BMI don't seem to predict uh, those people who do well or less well after surgery. So there's a whole area of research here that I think is still to be done. So it's a, an important area, but still I think a little bit embryonic uh, because we don't yet have clear guidelines. That's great. Well, I, you know, I'm delighted to hear that the two authors are already looking at this and that there's a document coming uh, to guide us at, at identifying which, which patients need to be be referred. That's that's really great. So, uh, Dr. Macedo, next, uh, uh, you know, many healthcare professionals know that the most problem that le leads to obesity in all the factors in terms of diet is sugar rather than fat, and genetics rather than inactivity. How did we arrive at the current state of public's understanding that the problem is inactivity, the problem is fat, while the research shows a completely different story? How do we get there? How do we change it? 
<laughs> well, that's a, a challenging question because, well, to, to understand the reasons of the, the public current understanding about and their, their assumption of, of what is wrong and what are the precursors of obesity, in, in my view, relates to something very simple and the obvious, which, which is the, the visible condition of obesity, meaning that when you, you consider any patient dealing with obesity, you, you see fat and, and you also see that um, uh, the, the patients do have several difficulties in, in terms of physical activity. So their activity is, is impaired. Now, um, if, if that's the obvious thing to see, how can we change this into a much more accurate, uh, let's say, reason to, to explain obesity? Well, I think what we need to do is, again, is, is changing this narrative into the real targets. And in my view, and it's not because I'm a gastroenterologist, it's because I really think that could, this could be a very clever way of, 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 of taking this issue, is, is consider the liver. The liver issues are, um, can be the, the, uh, the, uh, the appropriate target. They could be a very good, it could be a very good target. And if you explain to, our, to your patient how, how seriously the liver can be impaired in, in patients with obesity, and, and, and you focus on the big lab that the liver is and, and everything that goes on really happens uh, within your liver, then you get the chance of explaining to the lay public that there is a metabolic transformation that occurs throughout the liver and, and that makes the pace and that settles the pace for many of the ongoing uh, metabolic disarray that you find in these patients. So you change the azimuth, you, you, you take the fat and you take uh, the inactivity to the other areas, saying that it is something that is occurring within your liver. So I think liver could be a very good place to, uh, to focus, to refocus and, and to explain this need of understanding sugar as a, as a, uh, as a problem instead of, of, of fat. Now, uh, relating to this, and again, uh, when people have this assumption and get the idea that fat is, of course, the main issue, etc., again, we, we need to deal with something which I, I think is very important, which is the, uh, the stigma that we mentioned before. And um, you cannot fight stigma from others without, um, without considering it in your own business as a health care professional. If, if you don't feel equipped, if you don't feel prepared, either mentally or physically, to, to, and have the tools to treat these patients appropriately, uh, then you, you should uh, change your, 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 um, your, uh, your action. And it, it, it's a kind of healthcare provider mindfulness. I mean, we need to, to be promoting um, things in education about obesity. And this changing of attitudes, which is in fact the first goal of education, uh, will be necessary, but not enough um, if you don't aim the general public showing, explaining, challenging these concepts of obesity, changing this concept of fat instead of sugar, um, and changing another very important concept, which is the personal responsibility. So again, uh, don't kill the messenger and don't blame the message. Uh, we, we need to make clear to everyone that uh, the, the, this complex biological condition of obesity, it is a disability, uh, which is a characteristic, but not a defining feature. And I think this is really important for us. And once more, we as doctors need to express that we are health providers and not only um, a kind of a disease dealers. And I think that's a very important message. Great, great point. Um, next, we'll go to, to uh, Professor Shakora. So in the US, when you look at metabolic and bariatric surgery, more than 60% of procedures done are sleeve gastrectomy. And what's, what's your take on, 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 on that? And why do you think patients and surgeons prefer this procedure over other options like a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass or duodenal switch or other options? 
Well, I think it's attractive to both surgeon and patient because of its simplicity, no anastomoses, et cetera, could be done in about an hour or less, and uh, you could have a busy OR schedule and knock several out in the course of a day. So it has a lot of characteristics that both patient and surgeon found favorable. Uh, I think for high-risk patients, for bridge patients, those that, for instance, need to lose weight prior to maybe getting a transplant, I think it's the perfect operation. On the other hand, overall, I don't think it's the perfect operation. I think we're seeing more and more patients come back with weight loss, uh, either regain or poor weight loss to begin with. And I think the other major issue is there's about a 20 or 25% incidence of severe GERD afterwards. I have a feeling, my own personal opinion, is that the pendulum is going to start to shift back in the other direction. And we're going to be converting more and more of our sleeve patients to either a root gastric bypass or possibly a one anastomosis bypass or duodenal switch or something else. I think in addition to that, we're going to accept that because if you think of the history of the sleeve, it was invented to be a part one of a two-part process. So we're just in some ways being true to form that we're giving them the sleeve, they're losing some weight, they're having uh, either uh, inadequate final results or they're becoming symptomatic and then we're converting them to part two. So I think there's a role for the sleeve, but I don't think the sleeve is going to stay there uh, getting 75, 80% of all of the cases being done uh, as it currently uh, appears. Interesting. Great, great thoughts, uh, Professor Shikora. So uh, Professor Kothari, the, the COVID pandemic has shown uh, and and change many facets of our life. And there is some literature to, to suggest that patients with severe obesity, BMI over 40, have the highest mortality if they, if they get a COVID infection. And, and, and the pandemic has changed many things uh, the way we practice. How has the COVID pandemic affected metabolic and breath surgery in the US? And have you seen any increase in the number of patients seeking therapy because of this? Yeah, that is an excellent question, and um, it's one that I have been reflecting on this past year as well during the pandemic, and we were actually doing a uh, national survey um, uh, in the U.S. with ASMBS on this, and we're just getting the results back right now uh, because we are seeing record numbers of patients in our seminars in many places in the country and record volumes of surgery, and I don't think this is necessarily just rebound from when we were shut down. I think there's something else going on. And um, um, we do have a, uh, we'll be uh, presenting this uh, data nationally, but we do have data that, you know, about 6 million people for the first time during the, in the U.S., uh, during the uh, height of the COVID uh, pandemic, either entertained the idea of surgery or anti-obesity medications uh, for the first time, and so um, and, and and disproportionately also, African American population is seeing this uh, worried more about COVID uh, than others, and because the increased risk of diabetes and hypertension, you know, um, in in that population, understandably so, the same risk factors that they have uh, genetic predisposition for are the ones that have you having an adverse outcome with COVID, and so. It's starting to uh, come together and looking forward to uh, looking some more into that data and getting that message out and uh, ultimately published as well, because I do think there's a lot to unpack there and there's some important information. And sadly, it has become a wake up call, I think, for uh, what we're seeing in the U.S. and perhaps around the world as well in terms of seeing how severe uh, obesity is as a disease, and I think now patients and even other, perhaps other providers, are starting to treat it as such. That's great. Well, we 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 really look forward to the results of the survey and and looking at the disparities in 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 health uh, among racial racial lines as well. So, uh, Dr. Cao, uh, uh, you know, I want to ask you a, a a little bit of a challenging question. So, forgive me. Since cancer care is led by non-surgeons, oncologists, across, and 
and, and care is discussed for every patient in an MDT fashion before, you know, a decision on, 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 on treatment is made, is it time for surgeons to give up their leadership of the MD team to obesity medicine specialists? Or maybe when the time where there's enough obesity medicine specialists in our program? What are your thoughts? I think that's a very interesting question. The care of the patient with obesity can be complex. And like all chronic diseases, is best managed with a comprehensive team approach. So this multidisciplinary team may be independent or part of the metabolic and bariatric surgical service, depending on the model of each surgical service. Now we know that after metabolic or bariatric surgery, the role of the surgeon diminishes and the multidisciplinary team takes over the patient's management. We also know that the multidisciplinary team is about holistic care and usually comprise of a psychologist, an exercise physiologist, a dietitian, and a physician. So it works better if this multidisciplinary team is housed together and the members of the multidisciplinary team works in conjunction with each other and together with the surgeon. So I think a coordinated multidisciplinary team is the key to success for the long-term outcome for the patient undergoing metabolic and bariatric surgery. But this multidisciplinary team needs to be under the umbrella of a leader. So all team needs a leader. And I believe the leadership role can be from the surgeon, the physician, or even any member of the multidisciplinary team. Great, great comment. So, so you know, in, in, in conclusion to our hour, I, I, I really want to again uh, thank you for your leadership in getting together uh, as leaders of, uh, uh, you know, uh, very important organizations. And I want to give you a chance, each of you, to give us uh, your final thoughts. And uh, we will uh, uh, start first with uh, uh, Professor uh, Kothari. Um, any final yes. thoughts? Yeah, well, I think uh, I'm just, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity here. I think it's important to have these kind of dialogue uh, with uh, respected leaders uh, around the world. And uh, with our unified voice, I do think we have an opportunity to um, uh, change the mindset of uh, various societies that continue to discriminate against patients with the disease of obesity. Right. Well, well said. Thank you, Professor Macedo. Well, thank you. I think this was a great um, conversation and a great example that we could, with which we could nourish, let's say, um, the multidisciplinary teams that we deal with. I think the what Professor Lillian Kau said just minutes ago. Uh, really set uh, really brings us to the main issue uh, you you need good leaders in great teams and the teams must have an holistic approach so that the patient should feel comfortable safe and adequately treated and even the team must be focused on on, on that particular topic is treating the individual patient once we get this individualized targeted approach then we will all perform better so i think this uh, dialogue that we had throughout this hour is really a great example for many of our peers great great thoughts uh, professor shikora it uh, first of all I want to thank everybody again for including me and for having this this was an amazing hour and it demonstrates just how far we've come from a point where medical people wanted nothing to do with overweight patients and patients with weight issues. And us as surgeons, we were ignored. Now we're all coming to the table with positive ideas and respect for one another. And it's only going to get better in the future. So uh, the more we're together on this, the better it's going to be for our patients. And I look forward to the next several years. Thank you, uh, Professor Cora. So Professor Wilding. Thanks very much. I think, again, I, I would like to 
congratulate everybody on a really interesting discussion. I, I've learned a lot today, uh, and I think it's great that we have different specialities working together. This is a, a multidisciplinary, uh, the multidisciplinary approach is, is, is really important. You know, there is still more research to be done, but we have a lot of evidence that shows that treatment of people with obesity, whether it be with surgery or, or medicine, medical treatments, is effective. It makes a difference to patients' lives. It improves their lives. And I think we just have to take that message, the World Obesity Day message. It's time to act. We've got the evidence. Let's do it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Great, great thoughts. And, and, and last but not least, Professor Cow. Well, I think it's been a wonderful hour. I've, I've been very privileged to share it with my co-panelists and speakers. I like to say that obesity is a global problem. It affects more than 650 million people globally and more millions at risk. So to our audience, the fact that you have joined us means that you care about obesity and you will join us to help people with obesity and help us fight obesity globally. So thank you to our audience as well. So uh, thanks, thanks for the audience for joining us and, and a special thanks to our uh, uh, tremendous speakers, uh, uh, Professor John Wilding, the president of the World Obesity Federation, Professor Guillermo Macedo, uh, the president of the World Gastroenterology Organization, uh, Professor Shano Kothari, the president of ASMBS, uh, uh, Professor Scott Chikora, president-elect of IFSO, and uh, uh, Professor Lillian Cao, the IFSO president. Thanks you again. This was tremendous. It was really my pleasure and privilege. And have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Have a great day.